Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. I feel like a teacher. I'll wait until I have everyone's attention. Lovely. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. And welcome to our session on data-driven models for change. My name is Jake Porway, and I will be your moderator today. And I want to extend a huge thanks to the Skoll Foundation and Hannah Darton for inviting me and the rest of our illustrious panel to come have this conversation with you all today. A little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, though we are going to be talking about data and technology, we'd like to keep that conversation up here. So please silence your phones. We don't want to have any of that going on. Uh, we will have a Q&A session later, in which point we would love to make sure that you wait until you have a microphone to speak into it, because we will be recording this, and we want everyone to hear your wonderful, uh, insightful questions. And lastly, you do have a survey on your table that we'd love you to keep five minutes towards the end to fill out. Uh, I was much more excited about sharing that with you until I learned it had a moderator quality question. <laughs> so be kind. Five is good, not one. Um, and I think with that, with that, we can just get started. So we're very excited to have you all here today. And because we're talking data, I thought we'd do a really quick data collection thing up front. Uh, how many people here have data scientists in their organizations? All right, brave crews. Okay, and raise your hand if you are thinking about hiring some data scientists or data analysts. Okay, the hands go up. And how many people are just interested in what the heck all this data stuff is? Good, and if your hand is still down, I have, there's a lot of other sessions. You should check them out. They're, I hear they're lovely. Um, but really, this is exciting because I think, you know, even five years ago, we couldn't have had this conversation about data-driven models for change. But a lot has happened. A lot has changed, and a lot of people are showing interest. You know, 2007 was the year the iPhone came out, and now there are more cell phones on the planet than people. Now we're digitizing all of our actions online, we're surrounding our, our globe with satellites and sensors connected to us at every turn, and it's all creating this wonderful stream of data that could help us learn more about our world and our communities and ourselves than ever before. And so it's really exciting that we're kind of living amongst this, this new age of reason. Now you want to talk about fault lines, I mean, think about and finding common ground. What is a more key thing for understanding that common ground than data and information? And I think a lot of you are probably here because, like us on the panel, I'm going to maybe speak for us and say, it's such an exciting time, and yet it seems that 99% of this work around data and tech and, and AI and all this exciting stuff is mostly being used to kind of sell people stuff. Oh, my slide's not going forward. So I failed in teaching you all how to use these, uh, this clicker. But this is really the frustration. Silicon Valley and Wall Street are you know, using a lot of uh, technology innovations to kind of drive algorithms <coughs> that uh, help us buy things. And we really feel there's an opportunity for the social sector to be doing the same, especially as organizations are approaching data and technology, using cell phones, using computing, using digital data to actually improve their impact. So that's really the framing that we have for this uh, panel, is that we wanted to talk about the ways that five illustrious individuals, Sarah Jekyll, Ma June, Orin Yakobovich, Anya Calderon, and Jesse Baker, have been using data to drive innovation. Uh, just a little bit of context, uh, I'm very excited about this because I work in an organization called DataKind, uh, where we have data scientists from the for-profit sector and from uh, universities volunteer to do pro bono R&D data work with social organizations to say, hey, how can we use those same algorithms that are boosting profit to boost impact? And the thing that's really cool, aside from the projects, whether those are using satellite imagery to track epidemics or look at how water can be distributed most effectively, what's really cool is that we find this takes a lot of partnership and a lot of design. And so I'm very excited for the panelists today and the conversation we're going to have because we're not just going to talk about the whiz-bang, cool data and tech stuff going on. We're going to talk about how to make it happen. You know, if you're thinking about taking this first step into data, we're going to talk about what kind of capacity is needed, what kind of considerations do you need to take, and how are these uh, luminaries really leading the way. So uh, without further ado, uh, I want to let the panelists come and speak. The way that we're going to run this is actually like a mini TED Talk. So we're going to have five speakers give five-minute lightning talks about their work, about their data innovation and what it took. So I'm going to have them come up here, and then we'll have a little panel discussion uh, to follow up on that so we can just kind of have a really good dialogue about what this takes. So I'll get out of your way, and first we'd love to introduce Sarah Jekiel. She is the Chief Program Officer at Polaris Project. Uh, she has been working uh, since 2005 on anti-human trafficking efforts, and both domestically and globally. And really most important to this panel, I think most recently in 2013, she launched Polaris's data analysis wing to learn more about the scope, size, and systems of modern slavery and to find out where and how human traffickers operate and put them out of business. So with that, please welcome Sarah Jekyll. Thank you. 
Um, so again, I'm Sarah Jekiel, I'm with Polaris, and we are using data to fight human trafficking and modern day slavery, which affects men, women, and children all around the world in forced labor and commercial sex. And in order to do that, we need modern tools. We need modern tools that allow us to craft effective intervention strategies. And to do that, collecting primary data is crucial. So if you can't see it and you can't count it, you can't even begin to fix it. So I've spent the last 10 years helping to build Polaris' vision for a world without slavery. And a key component of that from the very beginning has been collecting as much data as possible about where and how human trafficking is happening. So what you see here is a heat map. So this is every case of human trafficking that Polaris tracked across the United States last year. And it's all sourced from the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which is a 24-hour hotline that Polaris operates. So hotlines act as a vital safety net. They have multiple purposes. First and foremost, they are connecting survivors on the ground to help and services, the people that are in situations of slavery that need our help. But a second point is that they also allow us to provide real-time tactical case data to law enforcement. And they act as a powerful source of insight for what human trafficking really looks like on the ground. This is the typology of modern slavery. So what you see here is just a handful of the types in a report that Polaris launched last week, which since I have it here, I'll hold it up. A typology of modern slavery in the United States. So we looked at 33,000 cases that allowed us to think about things like what kind of trends are happening? What are the hotspots? What are some of the migration routes? And we broke it down into 25 primary types of trafficking that occur in the United States. And what it means to break that down is to really look at the underlying business model. What does the business model look like? What are the trafficker profiles? What are the victim demographics? How were individuals recruited? What were their vulnerabilities? And what were their methods of control? So when you typically think about a hotline as a social service tool, we have this additional ability to collect critical information about what human trafficking looks like. And with the typology, so you can see here just a few of the 25 types, we're creating a platform so that people can engage in the issue in a different way. They can look and say, which of these 25 types exist in my community, and what role can I play to fight it? As we did this, we also started to think about cross-cutting pressure points. What are the legitimate and illegitimate systems that each of those 25 types are interacting with? So when we think about the formal financial sector, what are the ways that that intersects with agriculture? What about manufacturing? How about illicit massage businesses or escort services? We needed to look at each different type and think about what kind of critical access points might exist in these systems. The same can go for transportation. Who's trafficking people and using bus lines? Who's using train lines? What about different types of uh, airlines or airports or car rentals? How do we understand how we can bring the power of these institutions to bear for good? How can they play a role in helping to solve the issue of trafficking? This is a single individual network. So this is human trafficking in illicit massage businesses for both sex and labor trafficking. So this is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the data map that we have for a mid-sized US city. There's between seven and 9,000 illicit massage businesses across the United States. Trafficking isn't happening in all of them, but it is happening in many of them. And traditionally, law enforcement would look at this and they would whack-a-mole. They would close one individual parlor. Two weeks later, it would reopen under another name. They would also focus on criminalizing the victims for prostitution. So fundamentally, fighting this type of trafficking wasn't working, it didn't make sense. We weren't achieving anything. What you can see here is multiple different individual places, so specific massage businesses, business locations, so registered addresses, property owners, business owners, and at the bottom, you can see two law enforcement raids. So these were tied to human trafficking prosecutions. That was the only public data that was out there. What we did is took hotline data, public records data, and business data, and we were able to surface more than a dozen additional players that were connected to that network. So then what do we do with it? 
we're looking to partner with cities across the country, and so far we're working with 65 jurisdictions across the United States, and we're getting them to change their approach to fighting this type of trafficking. They need to think about it with a networked, organized crime-based approach. The conversation about data and human trafficking has been <coughs> proliferating over the last 18 months to 24 months. People are talking about data all the time. But we're not always using the same language. We're not talking about the same types of data. We don't understand how we can use it. What is the quality and how do we work with it? And most importantly, the people who have the best access to gather detailed data about the crime are survivors with lived experience and NGOs on the ground. And we need to focus on equipping those entities with the technology, training, and capacity to collect that data through mobile and cloud-based tools. So I'll end with the fact that responding to trafficking isn't enough. Ultimately, dissecting each of these networks is about moving upstream so that we can prevent trafficking. We need to focus on data-driven blueprints that actually look at how we eradicate the crime. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. I think that's such a great point. Uh, when a lot of people think of data, I think they often think of just the data that they have themselves. But here's a fantastic example of how Polaris is pulling tons of different data sets and marrying them together to see more than any one data set could see. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Next up, we have Ma Jun, who actually began his career working at the South China Morning Post. And it was his work there that led to the 1999 book, China's Water Crisis, as he investigated uh, various environmental problems in China. Uh, and that has led him now to found the nonprofit, uh, the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs in Beijing. And as the director there, he's led the development of China's first environmental public database, the China Pollution Map, as well as the Blue Map and mobile apps that allow people to upload this data and analyze it themselves. So without further ado, please welcome Ma Jun. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm so happy to have the chance to share with you how we try to use data to combat pollution in our country. You know, China has been through massive industrialization and urbanization. It benefits our country, but the environment pays a heavy price. And despite all these efforts made, we still haven't seen the turning point. Um, there's a growing understanding. This is not just about technology or money is lacking. It's also about the lack of motivation. You know, the weak enforcement and the low cost of violation took any incentives uh, from the companies to comply even with the basic standards. And uh, so in a way, why do we focus so much on data? Because we simply don't have much choice um, because you know, we still c couldn't, could hardly go to the court to drive this enforcement. So I believe the alternative got to be uh, extensive public participation. So from 2006, our group began to compile this uh, uh, government sourced the data uh, into a, a, a database to help people, uh, you know, to help people access. And uh, uh, all these years, we've witnessed the expansion of transparency in China. And Ten years ago, we launched the Green Choice Initiative with 20 other NGOs trying to enable people to better use the data. You know, we trust that the consumers can, can pressure the brands to green their supply chain in our country. So all this campaigning and engagement, uh, one by one, these multinationals and local brands began, started to use, compare their list of suppliers with our list of violators. And, uh, um, and, and through this process, uh, you know, using their, their, their major, major buying power to motivate uh, so far more than um, 3,000 major factories, their suppliers to, uh, to take corrective actions. But to, to tackle the issue like smog, we need to go further upstream of the supply chain to reach to the very energy and, in, and pollution intensive process, uh, and which is like iron, steel, and cement, which is so, so uh, much responsible, not just for local pollution, but for global climate change. And we had some, earlier this year, made some breakthrough. A group of 17 major developers, property developers, including the largest one in China, decided to, to go responsible sourcing. And we use our data to help them create the first uh, whitelist so that they can 
they can drive, motivate, you know, these major industries to, to start to change behavior. Uh, beside the green supply chain, green finance could be another major leverage. Uh, and at this moment, <coughs> we're joining with uh, our central bank um, to help with green finance uh, by providing the availability of, uh, of enforcement data of corporations. And we still need to reach out to the to the millions of, uh, of citizens who may we believe have the original, you know, is providing the original motivation. And uh, 2014, we launched the Blue Map app uh, to help people access all this uh, air quality data and also the first uh, map of water quality. And then, and then the 13,000 large companies real-time monitoring data. Every hour or every two hours, people can check their their, their, their discharge data. And uh, they can share that uh, through social media. And such a micro-reporting have so far uh, motivated hundreds of major coal power and uh, uh, cement and iron <coughs> steel to solve their problem. And uh, uh, yeah, here's the QR code for the Blue Map app, uh, the beta version in English. Uh, I have to warn you, it may not work. Uh, <laughs> my my I iOS programmer Literally, at this moment, still working on that. But I, st <laughs> but I still put it there because I, I think today, you know, we're facing this uh, fault line. You know, where one way to create common ground is to take advantage of the vast development of IT technology and the uh, expansion of data. So we can, if we can come together to, you know, make uh, environmental monitoring also go global, I think there's a chance for us to uh, address all this uh, uh, unintended consequences caused by this globalization and there's a better way to make the global trade and investment more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma Jun. I, I think that last point is really critical about how there, when we talk about divides and common ground, Though data haves and data have nots is actually a big issue. You know, it's like they say that the future is here but it's distributed unevenly. Uh, and I think here's a fantastic case where we're actually putting that power back in the hands of people. And, and I've seen other crowdsourcing apps before, but you're, they're already driving results where companies and environmental agencies are actually taking action. So I love that story of a way of bridging that divide through data transparency. That's great. Thank you. Next up, we have Oren Yakobovich. He's the CEO of Videre and actually started his work in the Israeli military. Uh, but after having uh, come in touch with the experience of the Palestinian people, moved to human rights and documentary filmmaking. I uh, was actually responsible for the project, I'm gonna get this right, uh, Shooting Back, right? a video project that has trained hundreds of citizens in the West Bank to use cameras to fight for justice, uh, and then in 2008 co-founded Videre to support networks of human rights defenders in the art and technology of documenting abuses and effectively sharing evidence with strategically selected decision makers. So please give it up for Orin Yakobovic. Thank you, thank you. So I, I feel a bit weird in this data conversation because I don't know how to call the information we are getting as data or is it part of the conversation, but I want to speak about places that we can't get data out from or it's very hard to get information. You know, we're kind of in a big buzz of information, smartphones, we're getting you know, data from all kinds of areas, but actually we have only 47% of the world population with access to the internet. And 3.4 billion people are consuming news that it's censored. So actually there's a lot of information that is out there that's not reaching to us and we cannot work with. And this is what we're trying to crack. Because in these places, when it's information is not flowing, is exactly the places, you can take it out, it's coming later, um, where the most horrific human rights violations are happening. And we are a human rights organization, we want to stop human rights violations and we need to understand how you work in these areas. So we build a model that we're basically engaging with communities, people, human rights defenders in these areas understanding what the situation, understanding how we can help to document human rights violation, build the technology or adjusting technology for their needs, so hidden cameras and all kinds of stuff that they can document, and then we take this information out. Now, two examples how we do plan and work in places where there's no information. I can't tell you name of places because of security, but I can talk about one dictatorship in Africa somewhere when we knew that the ruling party don't want to let go that we know that they're going to use whatever they can, all kind of manipulation to make sure they're going to stay in power. 
Now, it's a big country. We have limited resources. How do you build the project in this place? So the first thing we did, we collect all the information, all the data that was existing in news uh, uh, reports, in NGOs, evidence from the ground, understanding where the most horrific violations were happening. What we figured out that 80% of the violation was happening with 20% of the country. So we spread 200 people in these areas, trained researchers, that were sitting there and documenting systematically what the ruling party is doing. Then we collect all this information and start analyzing it. First of all, of course, using the metadata that we had to understand better locations and how we can use the information. But then we start looking at which kind of patterns of violence we can see coming from different places. Same language, same behavior, uh, same intimidation. And we understood that this basically, we can draw a line and say, okay, it's orchestrated. We can then take this information and engage with decision makers, with courts and others that can really sue or prosecute people that are doing this kind of events. This was around 2009, 10, 11, and this was just before the smartphone. It was just after the smartphone was out. So in this case, we had to rely on all kind of information that we can get visually, and visual was a very strong currency. I'm taking it forward to what's happening in, in our times. If back then every show that we brought was kind of made it to the media because it was gold, now we have ISIS beheading people in HD. So the visuals are losing the currency. We have to work with much more information around what we have to give it a context, to make sure that we know how to move uh, the system to create a change using visuals. So in one of the projects in other country, we decided to work on corruption. Now, everybody knew that in this country where we're working, corruption is existing. It's not new. You don't have to bring visuals of somebody giving money to prove there is corruption. But what we did, we based people in the main city uh, of this country, they work one year and a half with undercover cameras to collect all the information. So basically, they brought a lot of information about you know, who's doing the collection, which car they're using, who, how the network look like. So suddenly, slowly, with patterns of information and data, you start getting understanding what the system look like, who is responsible. But it also was very hard in this country really to change the system because the, 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 the jurisdiction is also corrupted. So you have to bring more information. So we got the money transaction of the main people in the network that we documented. We got the, uh, the phone records that they have. We got our hands on a lot of data that help us to analyze exactly where the money is flowing, how much money is been stolen, where, uh, uh, who is the, the one that's getting the money in the top and how they spread it down. And with this information, we engaged it, we took it to the courts, did a massive social media campaign to show how much money has been lost as a result of this corruption. And then using all this information, we managed to push the system and make sure, so this is kind of the structure of how we, how we did it and how we developed everything. And this is the amount of money that's been stolen. So basically, people in the street that are earning $300 a month, half of their money was going to extortion, to a corrupting system. And by analyzing everything in the system and engaging it to the right places, you managed to change the system. And eventually, we managed to take this system, these people out of the, uh, of the streets and saving basically millions of people to the vendors and the people that don't have to sp spend corruption anymore. So this is my talk about data. This is a bit different in terms of uh, information, but I think it's all part of this global work of how you use and utilize information and data to create a change. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Thank you so much, Warren. Just, uh, I think this is so important. It's funny that you caveated this by saying, hey, uh, maybe I'm not part of this data conversation. I, I couldn't think that's more far from the truth. You know, so many people, I mean, I think everyone here agrees just based on what we saw or heard. But uh, the, uh, th I think it's important because so many people think data and they think spreadsheets, impact data, measurement and evaluation. Very few people are thinking networks of actors, uh, video, imagery. So I think you all are really forging the path and expanding our thinking about what counts as data. So I think that's really impressive work. Also, gang, it's not that long ago in our history. We used to all get around the fire and just tell stories. We didn't have any PowerPoints. So my credit to everyone who has been flexible in sort of painting the picture. Uh, and I appreciate you all in sort of following along uh, with that. So thanks. Uh, next up, we have Anya Calderon. She has recently taken uh, the position of director at the Open Data Charter. And if you're wondering what that looks like, she spent the last three years uh, with the government of Mexico establishing the National Open Data Policy. 
And check this out. This had to establish capacity for building programs across more than 200 public institutions. She developed tools and platforms to enable the release of standardized data and built channels to increase the ability of citizens to inform data release and start a national data work, a network of over 40 cities. She's used this to help with financial inclusion and maternal health and is now spreading this work far and wide with the, net, the Open Data Charter. So please join me in welcoming Anya Calderon. Thanks for, thanks for having me. So I'm going to start with a story. Imagine you are a pregnant woman from a rural town in Mexico. Your income is below the welfare line, and for monthly checkups, you have to travel for more than 15 kilometers. If on that day you, ha you can afford it, you can take a 45 minute bus ride. Otherwise, it's at least a two hour walk. So in cases of emergencies, your situation is pretty much dire. This is true for one in five uh, women in Mexico. And around the world, close to 800 women still die every day from preventable causes related to childbirth and pregnancy. In Mexico, this is the only Millennium Development Goal that was not met. When I headed the open data policy in the government of Mexico, we knew that we needed better data to design new strategies that could address the root of this underlying problem. So working with the Ministry of Health, we were able to structure critical and very granular information uh, at such as the uh, infrastructure that was available in each clinic, the number of consultations and procedures that were uh, happening almost on a daily basis, and anonymized patient records that could let us know the level of education of mothers and how many prenatal consultations she attended. So by publishing this information in open formats and following standards that allowed these data sets to talk to each other, even across different data sets and other ministries, we were able to partner and collaborate with outside experts to paint a better picture of what contributes to this problem and what we could do to change it. So the use of open data here gave us the tools to quantify three basic things, just how important prenatal care, accessibility, <coughs> and quality healthcare services are, but mo most importantly, where targeted interventions could make the most difference. Today, these findings are being tested through randomized control trials, and you can see um, these women from a social development program called Prospera who are using, thanks to open data, a platform that's sending tailored and interactive text <laughs> message throughout a women's pregnancy, allowing them to rate their health checkups but also connect with an emergency line that if they feel any symptoms that could be associated to potential risks. Now the idea of greater access to information and evidence-based policy making can improve people's lives became very clear to me then, but it was not all, always the case. Often I encountered three main barriers for these data-driven models to, to provide some change inside of government. One had to do with the lack of access to quality <coughs> and timely information, which resulted in decisions being made in the dark. Two, when information was available, the skills inside of government to process um, and extract value from that data were often lacking. And lastly, and even most challenging, was being able to link the insights and evidence derived from data to actually influence the design, the procurement, and delivery of better public services. So while openness in government is essential in improving all of our lives, whether it's nudging behaviors to improve health outcomes, uh, allowing people to get to where they need to go in real time, you, you might know city, ma city mapper here, or empowering an army of volunteers um, who are monitoring election process for fair results, this requires institutional change. It requires um, institutional change in a way that governs data as part and parcel of the policy making cycle. However, all too often open data implementation in my experience has happened in a vacuum and isn't driven by user demand or any policy challenges and depends on the whims of individual champions. And that is why I joined the open data charter to help tackle. Um, with these set of six core principles that were developed through a global consultation process, the charter is providing a basic blueprint for how governments should collect and open their data to enable all of you and, and the great cases you heard before me to drive the change that we wish to see. 
by adopting the Open Data Charter, your government or organization can signal that you are on the side of openness because it leads to better results. And today, a growing network of reformers are embedding these principles into the practice and culture of governments. But we're really focused on how we do this in a way that is resilient to political change and supports developments uh, of strategies that can use open data to address the most challenging issues they face, uh, such as the case of maternal mortality I discussed before. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Anya. Uh, one of the things I love about that talk is that we think so often about what to do with the data and the tech, but not so much about the capacity that's needed or what it takes to actually understand how to, to use that. And so I love in uh, Anya's work that she's emphasizing not just how do we get more data out there, like if you build it, they will come, but how do we get people to have the capacity to think about how to use it? I think it's a theme that you'll hear a lot throughout the conversation to follow. Uh, and since the Open Data Charter, in, in a sense, creates this new supply of data, uh, jumping to supply chains, it is my pleasure to introduce Jesse Baker, the founder of Provenance.org. Uh, and Provenance is a digital platform that enables producers, manufacturers, manufacturers, and retailers to track the journey of people, places, and ingredients behind their products. So the thing about you know, supply chain tracking, what's really novel here is that they're using a new technology called blockchain, many people in here may have heard of, but it's just starting to make its way into the social sector conversations, uh, which basically is a ta tagging technology that revolutionizes supply chain transparency. So look forward to hearing more uh, from Jesse Baker at Providence. Great, cool. Hey, everyone. So this is a tough act to follow, coming fifth. Um, so let's throw it open for a question. Who here can put their hand up confidently and say this week they have definitely not bought a product that had slavery in the supply chain? No, right? There's a problem. <laughs> Every day we're all fueling supply chains that have bad social impact, bad environmental impact. And we set up provenance in order to do something about that. So the way we do that is we work with businesses in the food and drinks industry to help them solve a problem. So the problem is that they have opaque supply chains. They don't know what's going on behind uh, their supplier's shut front door, yet, and yet they're transferring that, that knowledge that they, they don't have along to their customers, fundamentally compromising all of our morals and potentially all of our health too. So how do we solve that problem? So we have built a digital platform at Provenance which enables businesses all along the supply chain to make their supply chains more transparent. Um, so we do this with a, a new technology called a blockchain. Um, and what it fundamentally allows us to do is to create a digital passport that carries along the supply chain with a product to help us all know at any stage of the supply chain where that product came from, who made it, and from what. So has anybody heard of a blockchain? Has it come up before? Cool. So probably lots of you know about it from the cryptocurrency Bitcoin, um, which is still the most successful um, application to, to run on a blockchain. But what it fundamentally allows us to do is to move from a, a data model where we have data stored in silos that are, are very difficult to make interoperable between different actors in, say, such a supply chain, to one where data is shared. So we create a kind of fundamental universal truth for information. And this can work not just in a supply chain, but lots of situations where you need to share data between parties that don't necessarily trust each other. So um, we were one of the first people to, to start using blockchains in, a, in an application like a supply chain. Um, and what it allows us to do is to essentially tokenize product. So that could be a ton of fish or a yard full of lumber store that information on a blockchain and link it to verified claims. So this is slavery free, this is from China, um, and track those th down through the supply chain. So tokenizing, like Bitcoin flows through the system, we're just tokenizing product and letting that flow through the system, which means it can't be double spent. So you can't say, oh, let's add some more slavery free lumber into the supply chain, but you can fundamentally track it one for one through the chain. So what does this mean? This means we result in kind of every product having this kind of digital passport, which comes with the myriad of people involved in creating it um, behind it. So we apply this in the food and drink sector, um, not just on, on wine through Europe, but we've also been working um, on global supply chains, fundamentally applying this right at source to, to the people that actually need traceability most. 
So we've done this in the fishing sector. So working with a local NGO in Indonesia, we registered fishermen um, on the blockchain in order to commit their daily catches um, and also ver their verified social claims. So the fact that they were using artisan techniques um, in a, a fishery that was monitored, um, they were being paid fairly, and a whole myriad of claims. We registered those claims into a blockchain, allowed the fishermen to commit their catches real time just using a simple SMS, and then along we go. We managed to track those fish through sometimes 14 chains of custody um, between the fishermen and export out of Indonesia. So this really allows us to create this kind of universal source of truth about a fish and its key claims, um, going from individual fishermen with their registered verified claims all the way down the chain until you hit even a supermarket floor. So you and me can avoid buying stuff made by slaves. So for, for me, like, I, I'm excited to be part of this debate because we think blockchains are a kind of new frontier for, for data to be able to talk to each other. We're working a lot on standards for how we might link these data sets together. Um, and we've just seen the myriad of amazing data that's out there. Adding a blockchain into the equation means we can all share that and start to verify so much more in real time. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. <laughs> Good back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Jesse, so much. And certainly, win points for the most provocative opening question I think we've heard yet. Uh, but I, I really love the fact that here, again, we're talking uh, not just about data writ large here, but new technologies for what you almost described as a universal truth. We hear so many conversations about how people share data across the same issue area and how they can compare that and what if people don't trust each other. It's possible this new technology uh, could actually forge that path, potentially. I think that's very exciting. So uh, we're going to do a quick little reshuffle here. So I want to emphasize, we've heard a range of uses of data and technology, from opening data up for more accountability to actually predicting things with it. Um, we want to have a little bit of a conversation uh, now with you all about what it really takes to do this work and what other innovations we're seeing. Uh, now, I you know, usually like to start something out with a provocative question to the panel, but honestly, uh, there's been so much good content so far. We kind of want to hear what you all want to talk about. Uh, so I'd like to throw it open to the audience to uh, start with Q&A, because this conversation could go so many different places. Let's talk about what you want to talk about. All right, I see some questions there, and I was told to wait for microphones, so uh, Eduardo will run this up to you. Oh, I think the woman in the green shirt in the back was first. Hi, my name is Natalie Bridgman Fields with Accountability Council. And I think we all accept that data can be used as an incredibly positive force <laughs> in all the ways that we've seen. My question is about how to avoid the co-optation of data that can be used um, for to have a negative consequence. Uh -huh. So provenance, for example, how do you avoid if it's the um, producer of the good tagging what it is, them mm -hmm. lying about it? So we work with people who are in the slave labor slave labor tea plantations of Assam. And if you ask the producer of the tea, they'll say that they have fair trade tea. <laughs> and so if they're the ones that are putting the label on it, and I think this question can be adaptable to many contexts, but, but uh, if, if you're the putting the data into their hands, then do you lose control over being able to have a counter narrative? Because now it's data. Nice. Thank you, Natalie. I think that is a very broad ranging question for sure. Um, how do you Really, it kind of comes out of how do you ensure the quality when there's potentially malicious actors out there? Jesse, since you were called out, I'm going to single you out first sure. and how you all deal with that. <laughs> sure, yeah, no, this is a great question. Um, yeah, because of course, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got a blockchain, if you put garbage in the blockchain, you've just got garbage on the other side of the blockchain. Um, so, yeah, and this is something we're working on a lot. So, at the moment, we, we are working to help reinforce existing systems. So, where there are NGOs on the ground and there's a lot of work going on on auditing that very point in the supply chain. Um, and essentially, our main role there is to stop that information from being lied about down the chain. So, so those claims being double spent um, so that one ton of, of slave-free fish doesn't turn into a 1,000 tons, which is what's happening now and compromising the whole system. So that's, that's the first thing that we reinforce. The second thing is we're now looking at other data systems to help reinforce the, the input data. So can we take data from other sources, like satellites, say, in order to help reinforce that catch data? Then on top of that, we're starting to look at reputation systems. So how can we ensure peer-to-peer? Because -peer, um, if you've got an immutable blockchain, if you lie, we, we've got that on record. <laughs> so looking at can we introduce a system in order to help pe 
people to be able to vet, vet their own data. I think there's a, a, a kind of an inherent thing with blockchains as well in that because it is an immutable record, it does become a little bit more difficult um, to kind of lie and forget about it, which, which can help a lot. But this is a huge challenge and, and something and he still needs a are lot you, more work on. Are you on. calling me to go undercover? Yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah, perfect, <laughs> sorted. Yeah, they're really clean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you could do that and then feed that data in, then we've got it all sorted, yeah. Well, very related to that, I'm wondering, uh, Orrin, how you, uh, you know, you get a lot of sort of crowdsourced material and you train people to do these documentaries. Do you have a sense of how uh, you in ensure uh, that the data coming in isn't maliciously created? Yes. So, first of all, it's really, ma there's two kind of data here, right? One is that you sourcing from, you know, open, open source and then you have all kind of do it, like, you know, scrapping information from it and trying to understand the cross information and what makes sense and what's not. A lot of the information is coming in all kind of, you know, very specific languages you have to understand. So, this is one thing. The other thing is our guys that are going in film, how we can trust them to bring the right information and how you can verify it. So it's starting with the way we're training people and what we ask them to do. So if they're going film somewhere, we'll ask them to film roadblocks, watches, stuff that you know, can get us into a place and then we can double check it with maps and with other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess I, I would just take it to the next question. So I think it's, it's possible to, use to get the right information in. The other side of it is how you make sure that the information is making the right impact, uh -huh. how it's not being used to kind of, you know, uh, contaminate the, the system more, because I, we find ourselves more than often having information that's about one perpetrators or, or uh, militia guys that we know that if we put it in the right place in the wrong hands, then suddenly we're becoming the big hero of the neighborhood, of the area, and then people joining him because he's the strongman in the area. So how you're dealing with it is a huge challenge. All right, so I like that it sort of piggybacks on Jesse's idea of having these external checks, whether that's a double checking or, or sort of another layer of data. I'm curious to the folks that work in open data, uh, if you feel a responsibility to check that as well, maybe Anya, I'll have you speak yeah, first to def that. Yeah, definitely, and, and that's often a question that, that comes up when, especially inside of government, the, the natural impulse is not to open data, uh, but to safeguard it, and uh, there's a lot of concerns around waiting for uh, the data to have the most quality it can when to, so it can get to a point where you can release it. And what we like to say around that is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? So if we uh, don't start opening this data and by opening it you can have uh, several uh, people become auditors of whether that data is, has good quality, we can verify the veracity around the data but the point is to start using it, of course, making sure that there's no personal or privacy or national security issues around it, but the point of getting it open allows for others to start using it and then um, in the long run, even the users of the data start improving its quality and, and giving it back sort of to the public good uh, that can uh, extract its value as well. Get it out there, get people working on it as to sort of add that accountability layer. Uh, Majun, I'm wondering if you face the same situations or anything uh, the same or different. And yeah, it's <coughs> quite, quite similar. I, would, I, I quite agree that uh, you know, uh, we need to uh, work, work on this, uh, focus on the issue of uh, credibility. You know, in this new kind of era with oceans of data, then you know, how do you trust uh, uh, this? Uh, I think um, one thing is, uh, is about uh, you know, the third party. Uh, data is uh, very, very important. You know, when it comes to the uh, factory's performance data, uh, especially you know when you try to link that with uh, with the sourcing practice uh, from those uh, uh, major companies, you created an incentive for them to make wrong sort of uh, uh, self-reporting, uh, uh, especially in a in a society like ours. Uh, still, the credibility gap is huge. So mm -hmm. that's why you know from 2006, we you know all these years we've been. Uh, try to maintain a uh, clean, cl clear, you know, uh, database uh, so that you know, with a, with a clear black and white st uh, standard, you know, legal compliance. And then well, I can't make sure ensure 100 percent accuracy of all these government monitoring records, but I can more or less ensure that the sources are correct. You know, mm -hmm. with uh, all coming from, you know the government sources. So every day we're tracking about 1,800 different sources and pull this data into yeah, our yeah. single platform so that you know, it's all you know, about the, the, the same criteria and then the same sources. And I quite mm -hmm. agree with our open data uh, colleague. You know, when you need to open this um, and then allow people to check and balance that. You know, our 
uh, our kind of real-time monitoring data of those factories. There are those who cheat it, uh, no, to, uh, f uh, no doubt about that. And, uh, but when you, you know, for 15 years, when this data is not open, no one knows at all. You know, when this data only accessed by the government on their own computers, they're not put the even in the most basic use, spending, wasting so much resources because, you know, they have been interfered by the local <laughs> officials, their superiors, who want to protect those uh, polluting factories. But now, you know, when they open that, they create a chance for, for all kind of people to, to supervise, to watch into that. We can compare the online monitoring with the manual monitoring and uh, through that, you know, identify quite some of the, those who fraudulent. Nice. So I'm wondering if I could, s oh yeah, there's questions out here. I'll, I guess, you know what, people are so excited with their hands Thank up. We'll come back, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, just because you're in front of me. Sorry, I think you're next to Sam. I am Melanie Edwards with Mobile Metrics, um, and we're big believers in, in research as well, um, in low-income communities. Back to the, the question on quality, and not to, to beat this, but obviously the data is only so good as, as the value of the uh, quality of the data and the sourcing. Um, so in that light, what are you all doing to train, you know, so it isn't trash in, trash out, uh, so they mm -hmm. really know what to put in, whether it be the fishermen, um, even more difficult for the human trafficking victims? Secondly, are there incentives? What are they getting out of participating? Is anything obvious that's compelling them to do that? Interesting. It's a good question. I may toss that to Oren, if put you on the spot in terms yeah, of training. So, as I said, a lot of our information is basically coming from people that we train, so we work with, and the, you know, their networks and their peers, so it's kind of, and they're all kind of working on the same uh, sphere, you know, human rights defenders, so they already have a, some kind of reach and they know what they're doing, so it's easy. The problem is not to exaggerate the data. So a lot of time, I'm saying 20% immediately you're taking it down because you know, they're politically motivated sometimes and they have their own. Uh, in hard cases, we're sometimes sending different sources to the same location to verify information and compare them. Um, so I guess I had less the issue of you know, the, the quality of data and who's put in where is the source. If we do it in, in open source, we'll be kind of supplementary materials to stuff that we have on the ground so can, we can prove or not prove and see what we're mm. happening. But definitely, this data biased here all the time that you have to be very much aware of. Um, I let my colleague <laughs> answer probably uh, <laughs> challenging. Yeah, really Just to keep going with this quality question, I think there's two, two s sort of fundamental qualities in terms of open data that allow uh, to sort of strike that right balance between openness and quality. And the one is around metadata, right? Ha uh, working around the each data sets to describe exactly what's behind the, da the data, how, what was the methodology used to, to publish it. And the other is the issue of sourcing around open licenses. So by publishing data sets with an open license, whether it's a Creative Commons um, attribution that lets you know who created uh, the data in the first place, you have a contact uh, where you can uh, go to the source if you have any questions regarding the way it was structured. But those two things are key as part of uh, the principles of open data. Let me jump to Sarah on this. Um, I, I know a lot of the people within Polaris uh, need to be trained on this. Anya made a comment before about uh, the not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, but uh, to your point, I'm sorry, what was your name? Melanie. Melanie's point about the stakes being fairly high. Um, when it comes to human trafficking, do you feel the same way or, that, or should we let the perfect be the enemy of the good? comes with this quality question. I, I don't think you can. I think you I think you have to take what you can get. I think because trafficking is such a hidden, illicit crime, we need to start somewhere and we need to start with the information that's coming in from the ground. I think it also depends on what are you going to do with that data. So from the perspective of information that we collect, we're trying to get the ground truth. We're trying to get the understanding of what's actually happening in the context of an individual survivor of trafficking's experience. But what we do with that, we're sort of one step along the corroboration chain, right? So if we submit a, a tactical tip or package to law enforcement, they're then going to take those additional steps to corroborate what type of information was provided. But at the same time, we use it for a lot of other purposes. So if we want to highlight um, the failure of the child welfare system to identify potential trafficking survivors, we can be looking at all the different ways that you know, hundreds of survivors intersected with that system and share that information with them for a learning purpose. So I think part of the conversation is what is the data going to be mm. used for and therefore how do you need to monitor it, what is the quality, but certainly the training for hotline advocates and for anybody working with the data has to be critical to understand how to get as much 
information as they can, but how to ensure that it's quality. So it sounds like training is important and a lot of corroboration clearly around this. But uh, I was hoping for a little bit of controversy, but it does sound like more, <laughs> more often than not. Sorry that to no, no worries. There's plenty of time. Uh, <laughs> but, but mostly, you know, it seems like start getting it out there. That's one way to verify. I saw a lot of hands, so I'm keeping moving to questions. Sam, I think you had yours up uh, earlier. Sorry, the white shirt over there. Hi there, my name's Sam Leon. I'm from an organization called Global Witness. Um, and as someone who works for a human rights organization who does similar kind of data investigations that were described earlier, I'm really worried about kind of the affordability and security uh, of some of the tools, um, particularly some of the proprietary tools that are being developed, such as IBM, I t IBM's i2 and Palantir's Gotham, um, given possible backdoors to security agencies and so forth. Um, and we've seen recently a number of open source projects that have been really useful for civic tech groups, um, such as Open Refine, Becoming Active. Um, and I think we have a great opportunity to kind of build shared infrastructure, um, open source infrastructure that's more secure and answers to the needs um, so we can all have impact. So I wanted to ask the panel, how do you use open source in your projects and what do you see as the opportunities uh, to share technology across groups? Great, thanks, Sam. And if I've got that right, for those who may not know, some of those companies, if I understand it, proprietary third-party software brings with it perhaps the risk of that data, very sensitive data getting sold or, or backdoored to governments. And so... Uh, open source technologies might be a way to circumvent some of that. Uh, so to the, the panel, whoever would like to take this, how are you all using open source technologies in your work? I'm going to go to the spark. Um, just because we're you know, a significant user of Palantir, one of the groups that you mentioned. So looking at the data security and understanding the privacy impact assessment was you know, a critical component of the initial startup, of building that system with them, building the ontology, understanding how it would work but also understanding what does the backdoor look like. So if there is a national security request that would come in from, for example, Department of Homeland Security and the political climate that we're in who are looking at potentially immigrant victims, what would actually happen? So we just met actually last week with our civil, civil liberties team to really dig in and make sure that we understood how they would respond to a request how they would be able to push back, what that notification system would look like to us, even in the most extreme circumstances of a national security claim. And so it's really about understanding what the access is and what the protections are that we have in place, just from our specific perspective of Palantir. Nice, I like it. Understand the back door, don't just let it be creepy. Um, did I was say, does <laughs> <laughs> unknown and mysterious. Um, I'm actually curious, uh, for Majun and Jesse, do either of you use um, open source? I mean, you're, the blockchain itself is open source, you've got open data. Are there technologies that you swear by for uh, transparency? And Well, I, th I think blockchains are quite applicable for this example. Um, I mean, so we're built on the open source project Ethereum, and the mm. whole point of Ethereum is to enable people to, have, to own their own data and own the permissions on that data in a system. People could create a backdoor to that system, <laughs> but it would ha everyone would have to be complicit in enabling that because you're controlling the permission on how your data is shared. So, I mean, I think with the right setup, uh, something like a public blockchain could be a potential solution here in the longer term, I'd say. Right on. So I, I would provoke and say that, you know, you can't close all the doors, and it's <laughs> definitely security is a massive issue, and everything that you're collecting can be used against people and vice versa. I think low-tech and high-tech, or the way you're working in the low-tech environment, there's security, you know, changing pattern, make sure you're not being followed. You have to embrace it into the tech world that we kind of you know keep forgetting because we kind of think we're putting all kind of algorithm in place it's fine I don't believe in it I think in the end of the day they all can be used and it's just matter about looking almost back tech and you know what's happening in the real world when you're trying to hide your information how you apply it into kind of more sophisticated system uh, good I like the provocation here and here we thought technology had solved everything for good uh, double-edged sword, unfortunately. But yeah, Mark, yeah. It is double-edged sword, and uh, of course you want more people to use the data, and uh, we, we've been trying to share with uh, different stakeholders, you know, uh, we open our data, you know, it's <coughs> all there. But on the other hand, you know, uh, the sensitivity of the data is the number one, almost like number one life and death concern, you know, uh, in, in our, in our uh, situation, in our scenario. So we have to be very, very cautious in handling, especially now we're getting a lot more data. You know, mm. we started with very limited, but now, you know, every day it's a million pieces of data and all this real time and uh, all those location, the geog uh, geolocation data of, of all those companies, you know, some of them very, very big ones, and you have to <coughs> handle all this information uh, quite cautiously. And uh, uh, 
but one of the ways is to try to really collaborate uh, with the uh, major stakeholders, uh, you know, to, to make sure the uh, a better, you know, uh, use of uh, all this uh, data. Uh, one of that is uh, through this, uh, through the 10 years of uh, doing this, you know, uh, some trust have been built and just very recently we started a interconnection between our app and the app platform and the government ministry's reporting platform of, uh, of the uh, polluting rivers. So with this, you know, people can use the app, take a picture and upload that, uh, and within seven working days get response from the government and some com confirm and try to verify. And through this process, you know, uh, the data can be better shared. Even those uh, uh, more <laughs> sensitive type of, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the reporting, you know, the reporting uh, by, the, uh, by the citizens. I, I want to ask one question and try to channel that I hope someone in the audience has because we could have this conversation and uh, questions about ethics and, and what to do with the data and open it. They're wonderful academic questions, but if the question I would have is like, great, so how do I do this? Like, what does this take? And so I'd actually love to ask the panel, what kind of capacity on your teams or with your partners did you need to actually accomplish what you've done? Um, and I wonder if I just run down, just say a note about like, what does what your data capacity look like? I'm gonna start with Sarah. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, our initial tool was Salesforce. So mm -hmm. in, in 2008, with 10 free licenses <laughs> from, from the Salesforce Nonprofit Foundation, we basically built up a custom system that allowed us to track 140 variables around hotline calls. Obviously, each call, you don't get that level of information. And may I but ask, who, who is we? Is like, who is this data team? What did it look like? That, that, was, that was me. So there you go. <laughs> with, <laughs> get a Sarah and some Salesforce. With, and with, with yeah. zero, zero background in that, <laughs> you know, but, but knowing sort of what we wanted to connect and collect and knowing that, you know, a million sheets of paper was, that were intimately color coded was no, no, no longer going to work. Um, but I think what we found over time was a couple of things. One, a custom built product did become challenging at times. We realized that we weren't actually benefiting from a lot of the native functionality that either Salesforce had or that they built in over time. So because our custom system and our sort of use case is pretty unique, we did have sort of this period where we were constantly rejiggering to understand how we could best take advantage of the, of the data. But when we started to work with Palantir, um, you know, luckily we had just a, a brilliant uh, person on my team who I feel like is magical and can do anything. <laughs> and she um, started to help us build out our understanding. But eventually we moved towards taking on intelligence analysts, people with you know, backgrounds that wouldn't be typical or, or traditional for a nonprofit setting. So we did reach a point where we needed to build in you know, the actual technical capacity but we also found that there was a massive uh, you know, willingness to fund that, that there was a lot mm. more interest in um, supporting the build out of that tech capacity. And I think now we're sort of moving into multiple channels, but I would hope that there's still people out there that will fund the R&D. That's the piece where I think we've learned the most, but we also have a hard time sort of funding that just, just let us play with the tools that we have and the things that we're learning and see what we can produce out of it. So I think that's a critical need for us still. Great, so start with some free stuff and get a Sarah and then build your way up. And, <laughs> uh, but I think it's interesting, actually, please, uh, one day, maybe after the session, I'd love you to follow up on how you did get that funded because, you know, in our experience, I'm very biased because we try to offer this for free because so few people actually can make that case to funders. A lot of funders don't fund it, so I would love to know your secret. I think it's partially because human trafficking, there is no data. That's, oh, okay. That's the thing. It's such a dearth. It's a constant thing. So if you can produce anything around, you know, the hidden crime, then you are right a, step a, a step ahead. Interesting. I'm going to take our time with this one. Oren, I want to hear how you got so your we, data capacity. We're actually now just building innovation department that is kind of build a lot of experience that we learned through the years. So in the beginning, we have a tool called Central Visualizer that is basically was used in the, uh, in the UK to map gangs and how you're putting all the information inside and creating a pattern. So this, we put everything inside and start kind of looking about how to navigate our effort. And we also have a, a, a you know, cataloging machine that is kind of getting all the information that we, everything that we are filming has been cataloged and scrapped. So you know, all the metadata, it's all there. Mm. So combining this with the other analytic tool is targeting a very good patterns of very, where it is. It's, the amount of data is growing all the time and you want to put it much more flexible, there's some in the market and we kind of specifically have a team of like four people, three people, three and a half, that are researchers and technologists that really helping to find the right tools and make sure that we really 
make, ma maximizing the information that we get. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. And as a result, what's happening is that we're putting much more effort in the technology and have less effort in the operations. So in the oh. beginning, it was 200 people filming, spread what we call the net approach. Now we have like a much more targeted mm -hmm. approach and we have much less people filming and much better results. So it's kind of building each other together. Nice. It actually helped your efficiency in the long run. Definitely. And you know, similar to Sarah saying you don't usually think of having a data team, having an innovation team uh, is pretty rare. So I think that's really fantastic yeah. and probably necessary to get this stuff to work. Thanks. Jesse, I'd love to know what's your <laughs> data team, data capacity look like before you started? Um, yeah, I mean, we were just a small gang of software developers. Um, yeah, I mean, now you can build an application on a blockchain. It's not too complicated. Um, I think it was a, it's got much easier recently. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a fancy database, basically. Just build a web application, and then just rather than putting data in a normal database, you're just doing some stuff and putting it in a really, really <laughs> secure one, basically. Um, but you can't, I mean, it's not too complicated. I mean, I was at Hackathon the other day, and I saw a really simple use case for a blockchain, which was just making use of the fact that it's immutable. So they just, to avoid corruption. So say in a, in a country, they've got records of voters or something, just scramble the whole thing together into a small string and put it on a blockchain and then you've got a permanent record that no one can tamper with of who voted for who. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that was a pretty simple application that was built in a weekend hackathon and it provided probably the most secure data infrastructure ever for that com nice. company's election results. I love it. Well, so, and it sounds, thank you, sounds very um, straightforward, but you know, there were not, you know, not everyone had their hand up that they had a data scientist or data team. So when you say it's mm -hmm. as easy as going to a hackathon, Who's there? What do you need? What kind of people? Definitely, you do need some programmers. Need. Yeah, okay. probably need no, to be able to write a little, <laughs> yeah. a little bit of code, just a yeah. tiny bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. But not okay. that much. Not that much. It's not rocket science. It's, oh, good. Well, you know, yeah, it's just, it's just <laughs> bit of JavaScript and a yeah, few right, other right. bits, but not. It's not crazy. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, good. So not crazy. Maybe there's ways through hackathons <laughs> or some develop programmers, yeah, developers definitely. to get that. Great. I know. Love to know when you do open data charter work and government expansion. What kind of data capacity do you see them needing? Um, well, yeah, I had to navigate a somewhat of a different ecosystem inside of government. So, for us, um, speaking with with ministers to get them to become open by default, they, you get some <laughs> very confused and scared faces at first. So, uh, we had to have a mix of sort of tech and policy experts to to help us um, define what it is that needs to be done but also build the legal frameworks to sustain uh, and support this work. Mm -hmm. And then some storytellers that uh. could uh, help us explain why and what the value add was, what they're gonna get out of opening their data in ways that could help them achieve the goals that they were, that they were so focused on. Lawyers were also very helpful there. Uh, <laughs> in terms of, of, of licensing and what is legally implicated once you start publishing your data. So I, I think essentially this scenario, is, and it's something I really like about this community, it's that it's about building partnerships with diverse uh, experts uh, and skill sets behind uh, from those that can help you address those specific data uh, skill sets, but also those people that are asking the right questions, and that's where we need to build the partnerships. I love it, the storytellers and the people asking the right questions because without that, it just, what are, you, what are you even doing? The people can't use the data and, and work that you come up with. Love that. Last but not least, Majun, what does your data capacity look like? Yeah, 2003, uh, it's 2006 when we got started our I IP, we got three people with, uh, with one you know, who knows about some programming. And uh, uh, luckily at that time, uh, you know, we uh, did not have much information available, so we can still hire you know, many uh, uh, our, our volunteers, you know, from the university to help mm. us with spreadsheet after spreadsheet, <laughs> you know, need to fill out this very, you know, it's a, a lot of manual work and then put that, uh, build the database and uh, feed that into that. Uh, but all these years, uh, you know, it's growing and uh, so now we have in-house, we have two programmers, uh, uh, quite some of them, and then uh, also need to, uh, you know, because we do the app, so we need to in-house all this iOS, uh, Android uh, uh, people, and uh, now the data is uh, so much, there's so much more data, so manually it's almost like impossible to track, you know, 1800 uh, sources every day, so we need to use computers to programming to monitor, you know, whenever there's an update, but we still have people. 
to help verify everything because this is about, you know, our database is more about legal risk, you know, uh, 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 compliance standard. So you have to make sure each one of that is, is accurate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and now, you know, uh, since uh, the, the number of factories we, we track have grown to some 800,000. So at this moment, uh, uh, spreadsheet cannot sustain that. So we have to really, as you said, get the real data analyst uh, for the first time, you know, just fairly recently. So it's a uh, gradually, uh, gradually evolved, building, yeah. yeah. That's great, though. I mean, I think leveraging the power of partners and volunteers is really critical for folks who can't start. I mean, I'm biased, of course. We run a volunteer data scientist group. But, the, uh, but I think that is really important. There's so many other groups out there that have that free capacity. Um, we are about three minutes from the end, gang. Went really quickly. So I want to do this to take us home. If you're like me, I'd be thinking, great, so what do I do Monday or next week? So I'd like the panel to think of just sort of the one sentence. What is the one sentence of advice you would give to folks? to get started on this, to do what you have done. You've tread this path, how do they follow up? And while they're thinking about that, I saw a lot of hands, I'll take one question, and probably just one person will answer quickly, and then we'll, oh, who's trying so hard? <laughs> take, take us home with this, yes. Um, you didn't talk at all about business models, and um, so to the extent that there'd be some quick thoughts about business models uh, for this, because we want radical collaboration, you're open, but then what's investable here, and, and what business model approaches are people taking to make this self-sustaining at least, and to uh, drive it forward in a much bigger way? Such an important question. Kind of lightning round. Does anyone want to jump in on business models? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Such a deep conversation. Yeah, I kind of, you know, it's a bit like I'm, I'm talking a lot about, I don't know, how we really use this information, you know, to monetize and make sure that kind of we're working. Like, I, you know, we, we open, we heard yesterday in the opening planetary, uh, we need talking about, you know, how all the, you know, the businesses have to be changed and, you know, clean their supply chain and make sure and there's a value for this. And I think everyone can use a different technology. Like, you know, I'm the undercover investigator that can bring information from the front when they don't have access to and monetize on it. You probably can do something similar. And I'm sure there is a lot of stuff that you know, it's it's worth a lot of money. What people here are doing, it's very hard to convince people that they have to pay for this. Um, and a lot of it's like approaching customers to make sure that company understand that there's a, a there's a value here. But yes, I think we're only this process of you know, consciously, unconsciously, we're trying to figure out you know how we first of all survive and make sure that our organization are existing, and while doing it, also doing good and making sure we change the whole uh, um, you know culture of businesses. Yeah, so this is at least my take on definitely that. Definitely too hard to answer in just one minute, but either on your, or Manjun, you look yeah. like you want to jump in on monetizing. Yeah, the, uh, we, 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 yeah we've been constantly challenged about, uh, you know, the business model uh, question and uh, 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 including, you know, fr the challenge from the SCO, uh, <laughs> uh, our SCO co uh, Foundation colleagues, uh, you know, who said that you, you're so, you, you, you win a work for social entrepreneurship, but you, you don't, you know, you don't have a sort of any business model, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so I, yeah, it's quite uh, a little bit embarrassed. Uh, but uh, 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 but our challenge is that so many brands uh, uh, they are using our our data, but in the meantime, there's a you know one thing you know I know that I started with a with a with a uh, only three people, and now some 30, 34 people. You know, we can manage to motivate them because we have some something called credibility. And uh, if, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if I uh, do that, uh, I'm going to lose the, uh, uh, lose that. But now there's a, uh, but the data by itself does have value. So there's a chance for us to, uh, to, uh, to, to explore that. And now there's a, as, uh, as Jake put it, uh, there are now uh, finally some uh, opportunities which I, I deem will not have this conflict of interest. So we may move to that. Fantastic. Thank you. Much more to be ha conversation to be had about that topic, obviously. So I hope you will find all the panelists. Uh, I want to please thank everyone again. These fantastic panelists: Sarah Jake, Orin Dekolovic, Jesse Baker, Anya Calderon, Machun. We are so at time that we won't even get. Can we just run down the line really quickly? I know people are walking out. Just what's that one sentence on what people should do? Majun, do you have it? Yeah, do, do, do use data. I think this is a great <laughs> Do use data. That's it. We're going to that. Yeah. Uh, adopt the open data charter. Adopt the open Let's data charter. Do it up, Jesse. Yep. 
I build on that. Make an open standard. Yeah. <laughs> Make an open standard, Oren? Don't talk about data. Talk about narrative. Oh, don't talk about data. Oh, a lot of oohs and ahs. You just got a five on that survey. And Sarah? Believe that you can do it and be willing to share. Believe you can do it and be willing to share. That's good advice anytime. Please, thank you again so much. <laughs> thank you all. Please do fill out your surveys and hand them to our filter. Thank you.